I'm going to teleport you guys now towards the other side of the world in South America. Um, where I'm, I'm working on a project as part of the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology and as part of a larger ERC project. Um, it's multifaceted, working on different, different areas being archaeobotany, uh, phytoliths, um, zoo archaeology, paleoecology with late coring to reconstruct environments. Um, as well as paleoclimates, as well as ancient DNA of humans and environmental DNA of sediments. And then my corner of the world, it would be working on some of the, the body fossils that we have from these sites and museum collections, as well as new and ongoing excavations. Um, now, it's important to note that our first excavation was done just prior to um, lockdowns worldwide. So we did get some sort of um, analysis in where we had thousands of processed bones uh, at these rock shelters in South America, but they're also just above it were adorned by thousands of images of uh, humans, geometric designs, plants, animals, um, potentially some shaman ritualistic uh, scenes as well. Uh, and how does this really play into, does it reflect the faunal um, population in, that we find in the fossil record as well. And we're finding that, yes, in a lot, a lot of cases it does, but also um, based off some morphological analysis, uh, there's potentially evidence of megafauna in this rock art as well, which will hopefully be further elucidated with some environmental DNA of sediments. Um, so we can prove this. Uh, but largely this area is, uh, is significant because it's the last place, um, last continent other than Antarctica to be explored and inhabited by humans. Uh, particularly in the northwestern region, it has a mosaic of different environments, including um, high altitude uh, mountains, deserts, forests, open savannas. Um, and just like humans will be bottlenecked um, on through the Isthmus of Panama onto this larger um, continental platform, so were animals over time during the Great American Biotic Interchange, uh, millions of years of uh, intercontinental dispersal of taxa, trading um, fauna back and forth uh, between uh, South and North America, um, and also led to one of the largest extinctions uh, during the late Quaternary extinction event, um, with South America experiencing upwards of 84% extinction of um, uh, megafauna at the general level. And that leads to debates on whether humans or the environment cause this extinction. I'm not going to get into that, but it is important to note that there are uh, lots of warming and cooling events that happen during this late Pleistocene, early Holocene transition. Um, we do have some good direct evidence of human hunting in South America, uh, specifically this site in Brazil shows uh, a juvenile Nodiomastodon pladensis being uh, impaled potentially by a bone tool. Um, whereas other sites that have similar faunal assemblages, um, as we move more northward, uh, they have no direct evidence of human remains, uh, but there are uh, similar faunal assemblages that go extinct uh, in the same sort of time span. So regardless of whether what these drivers were of extinction, um, the defaunation of animals on this platform has significant longstanding effects, whether it be for nutrient cycling, carbon storage, or even um, plant diversity. Uh, and uh, our region specifically, there are a lot of animals that exist today that still facilitate these behaviors, whether it be herbivores, um, ecosystem engineers, uh, seed dispersers, um, or predators at the sites. Uh, but back in uh, late Pleistocene, early Holocene times, we would have had a larger degree, a larger um, population of, of these animals and, and more diverse. Um, and when we zoom into the Northwestern area, all those little yellow dots represent um, sites that have fossil remains uh, that we are looking at, excavated, or are including in our data set. So it's a heavy focus on the sort of the, the savanna of Bogota area. Um, and we will be extending further down into the Amazon as well. But for this talk, this is what we'll be focusing on. And because it does have this extreme diversity in, in environments that has been pretty well mapped out as well in regards to C3 and C4 differences um, and source plant material uh, with 
the gradient being pretty um, a, a large difference in the C4, C3 in this uh, northwestern area. So when we go into the collections, we're looking at mainly three different groups of sites. Um, the first being the top being the oldest site, Pubenza, around 16,000 years um, in the uh, before present. Uh, and then some of these other legacy sites like Tibuto, which I'll be presenting on now, which this data is just starting to roll in. Um, so bear with me, we have a lot on the gas bench, but this is the data that I am I'm working with. And then we have other sites that have remains of humans, um, direct uh, evidence of humans and body fossils or Tekendama and Akwazuke. So like with many other studies, we're going into the muse museum collections and serial sampling from as much material as we can. Um, but uh, a lot of these fossils are extremely delicate. Um, and so we, although I would love to sample a little bit more at the risk of breaking some of these, um, we did a strategic approach of doing a systematic intervals between the zero samples. Um, from this data, these are the first sort of 40 or 50, uh, 40 results that we're getting. And all the ones in yellow are gonna be representatives of horse um, specimens. And then purple being representative of our proboscidean or gompathir material. And you see that the, the ones in yellow, our horses are leaning more towards a mixed or C4 environment, which we might expect. Um, but a C3, uh, more of a C3 environment for our gompathir. Um, possibly showing that they're occupying different ecotones uh, within or around this region uh, at this site. And when we delve down deeper into the horse um, serial samples, we see that they co-vary pretty strongly with each other, um, possibly capturing different uh, source material or even potentially some seasonality amongst um, these, these samples. So again, hopefully we'll, we'll see this similar pattern as we um, get through the last four or five um, teeth that we have for horse. And then with the gompathir, these proboscideans, this sample is a little bit um, dampened potentially because of what they're initially eating or if they're moving in and out of this region. Um, we also have sampled for strontium. Those haven't been run yet, but that would help get at um, understanding the story a little bit better of why we're getting these, these values. Um, all in all, collectively, uh, in this area of the, the high altitude Andean um, forests, we have a greater diversity in C4 grasslands, whereas, um, uh, but some native species found above 2,500 meters. So with, that's, at this site, we're right at that 2,500, like maybe 20, 600 meters site, so it's pretty high altitude. Um, and based off this, our ongoing idea is that these horses are potentially occupying different ecotones uh, moving through this gradient, whereas the gompathir are either preferentially selecting a more limited diet or seeking it elsewhere. Um, and hopefully, like I said, the strontium will, will let us uh, understand that a bit more. And more interesting, we've also collected some human remains. We don't have data from this yet, but the sites um, that we collected are close in proximity to Tibito, this initial site, um, as well as we collected from a number of different environments across the, the landscape where we're interested to see how this plays in to effect. And um, to highlight these different sites, uh, they're still marked by the yellow squares there, but also the yellow circle on the south southern area is uh, the Department of Guaviare, which is um, at the border between the Amazonian uh, forest and then also these savanna um, ecosystems. So we're trying to capture as much uh, as we can here. And there has been some work done on this uh, initially, although um, working with these um, initial publications and collaborators, we're gonna hopefully triple if not six times as many samples to try to get a higher fidelity um, look at what's happening over time at these sites. So all in all, the lofty goal would be to contribute to, um, sorry, these la larger data sets and eventually contribute to some sort of ice escape, which is desperately needed in this area, but um, has high potential for, for, um, for being developed. So with that, um, I should thank my team and thanks for the opportunity for letting me speak.
Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was super interesting. Do we have questions for Michael? If not, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, actually. Sorry. Yeah. To... <laughs> no, no, it's good. No. Um, I was wondering um, a bit about this really damned amplitude in the mm -hmm. computers. First of all, I was wondering if in the plot, is it an area that's relatively arid or not so much? Yeah, it's comparatively to the surrounding area, it is quite arid. Yeah. Right. Because I was, I think my first thought was that, oh, maybe they might be drinking from a relatively buffered mm -hmm. water source, but that wouldn't explain also because I think the carbon was also quite flat. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Right. And do you know, because you were talking about also like, oh, maybe it's an influence of um, tooth formation. Mm -hmm. Do they have relatively slow forming teeth? Like, would you expect a lot of time averaging in the teeth or? Yeah, it is pretty low from from initial like enamel formation and then mineralization it is a, a large span of times and they also come in sets of teeth too so I was I was 